tell you a few people that have heard of him. Tiger Woods. You guys know Tiger Woods? Remember at his peak? He had a corner man. Lance Armstrong, probably heard of him. When, when the USA team for Tour de France is falling apart, when they're at each other's necks, when they're mad at each other for the way they're squeezing toothpaste out of the tubes because they're so tired and frustrated and ready to give up, you know who they call? They call the corner man. Seven or eight? Where's, where's Jeff? Seven or eight Tour de France's? Nine. Nine. Nine Tour de France victories in a row. He, he was the guy in the corner. He's the mindset coach, the performance coach. Richard Branson. Uh, Dave Asprey, when he realized the magnitude of what bulletproof coffee could be, and he said, I don't know if I can do this. He called the corner man. He is an Olympic medalist himself, which is an impressive feat, and has coached over 40 other Olympic medalists and world champions. He has a gift. He can tell me what's coming before it comes. You ever notice, like, sometimes, especially in a market where everybody's panicking, it's like, guys, shut up, we're going to be fine. Uh, it's probably because I talked to my corner man beforehand. So Jeff was gifted to me. Dr. Jeff Spencer was gifted to me uh, by Jeff Moore, a friend of ours. And it's my honor and privilege. I'm super excited to gift to everybody here the privilege of hearing from and over the next couple of days hanging out with, spending time with the... Dr. Jeff Spencer. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You want the mic? yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Well, we can actually dispense with the podium here, which is great. So um, I guess the first thing I'd like to start off by saying is that, um, you know, anytime anything goes haywire, right? Like, obviously, there were some technical issues this morning. <clears throat> but the uh, champions, and that's all I know, that's my calibration. Everybody else starts unraveled because they feel like if it's not going the way I anticipate it, then I'm not going to be ready to take advantage of it. And that's complete garbage in the champion's world. They don't think like that. That's not their calibration. They always know that when things start to veer off, that all the amateurs are going to run for the exit. They're going to go crazy. And then as their brains lock up, then their ability to execute what has to go right starts to fragment. And then they panic to try to get back what they thought they're going to lose and then things just compound, right? And so then what happens with that is that your confidence in self goes in the toilet, and then you don't trust yourself from that moment forward. That's what people do. And champions don't think like that. It's like, okay, hold on a second here. You know, maybe this is a gift to me that something else is gonna happen, and it's gonna be an advocate for myself that I can't be there for myself when I need to be there for myself, to show me a better option. And so I'm not sweating the fact that we're getting started however late we're getting started. I could care less about that because what does matter is the quality of our conversation. And timing is everything. Right thing, right time, great. Right thing, wrong time, forget about it. You know? So again, I look at this as a, just an amazing gift here. And uh, what I want to share with you today um, and the level of conversation that we're going to be having here is that, as I tell my good friend, Nick Peterson, and we spend several hours a week together in open-ended conversation. We're not an agenda because, as I told Nick, I'm not in a hurry to win a silver medal. It's not my idea of fun. You know, neither is a bronze medal. I'm not saying that that's... Uh, not significant or impressive because it is. But that's not the expectation. You know, hey, what do you say we build a bronze medal team? How's that sound, everybody? It's really inspiring, isn't it? <laughs> this is awesome. Let's all go home with our bronze medals. And I'm not saying that that's irrelevant, but I'm saying the fact is, is that uh, I only know one way to have a conversation. And when you step across that threshold, the conversation is going to change from chit chat, nice, nice, to a real conversation about what it takes to get to the top and stay there. That's all I know how to talk about. That's all I think about. So why am I here with you today? I'm 70 years old. You know, so 
again, I'm here for a variety of different reasons. Him, Petey, Mario. And I know that anybody that shows up in their presence is at the right place. So I know that I can come here, and you and I are going to have a conversation at the highest level. We're not going to say, OK, let's talk at a certain level about the future and what that looks like. No, we're going to have that conversation like right now. Because you've got to know what this is like. You know, people say, I want to be a full potential player. You know, OK, well, why don't we talk about what that is? And it's like I've never had a person that doesn't apply to do some level of advisory with me when I ask in the essay question, you know, what's getting in the way? What do you think they say? What's the first thing they say? What's getting in the way? Me. All right, well, if it is about you, then why are we talking about the next opt-in strategy or formula? Well, maybe this is more about you than about that. Because if you can't take hold of the steering wheel, then all that other stuff doesn't matter. You can have the greatest techniques, strategies, tactics in the world, but if you don't have you to be there, then it, is, it doesn't matter. So I chose to start with this slide here. Why would I do that? Well, because it's gold. That's my favorite color. It's just the way it is. So we're not going to have a bronze medal conversation. Is that OK? OK, great. So I, I had this guy come to me recently here, and he was a, an executive at Google. And what he said to me, he said, look, I have a once in a lifetime opportunity to drive my flag into the moon. And if I get my flag right now planted in the moon and the time is ticking, then I'm set for the rest of my life. But he says, I know the clock is ticking. And I don't know exactly what to do here, but if I, wish, if I miss this window, then I'm screwed. I got a once in a creation opportunity to take advantage of something that's never been done before. It's proven itself to have merit, so it's not an experiment anymore. I have time to get on the bus. And he says, uh, I don't quite know exactly what to do or where to start. Because the tendency is to try to want to do everything to make sure that you don't miss the bus. Because you're haunted and terrified about missing the bus. The faster your mind goes, generally, the worse the choices that you make. So that's where I'd like to begin our conversation. So what I told him, the very first thing I said to him was, you got to be really clear about one thing, is that if you want to win big, it's not an accident. It's freaking supposed to happen. It's by design. It's on purpose. It's intentional. I was working with an athlete once when I was working with athletes. That's kind of the space I come from. And at 1 AM, I got a call on a Saturday night. And I like the calls at 1 AM, because it means that somebody won something of high significance. And he said, I won tonight. I said, congratulations. And he said, can you believe it? I thought to myself, what do you mean, can I believe it? What do you think we've been working for here? <laughs> you know, well, yeah, I can believe it. But I had a lot of doubt about him, because he wasn't certain that he earned it, or it wasn't like a fluke, or he didn't stumble into it. And so his career unraveled, because he didn't have what it took to believe that that was true. So what I'm saying to you is that winning big is not an accident. It's intentional. And I went on to tell him, this guy from Google, right? You know what it's like to have a piece of chocolate cake? Like almost in your mouth, you can smell it, but you can't eat it yet? You know what that's like, right? You want that so bad, you'll do anything to get it. I get that. So what I told him was, I said that I'm going to tell you the champion's secret, so listen up, because I'm only going to tell you this one time. I said, here's the champion's secret. Number one, you have to be able to win big guilt-free. Because what happens is that When you have to pursue something of high significance that's in front of you, that you know to be true, and you know the, cl the clock is ticking, and you only have so much time to be the person on the bus where the bus doesn't leave the station without you, right? Because if the bus leaves without you, you can't get back on. You're going to be like the kid standing in the gutter with his backpack around his knees looking like this. 
you know, while the school bus left and the kids have their nose pressed against the back window and they're all laughing, waving at the guy because he freaking missed the bus. And so we have to be mindful that to do certain things, there's a human tendency, got the word human tendency, to be really guilty because I'm spending time away from my family. I run the risk of rejection from people that used to like me. I want my Jeff back. Where'd Jeff go? You know, Jeff isn't here anymore. Okay, you know, parents, uh, uh, you know, if you have time, uh, I know you're busy. Um, you know, we love to hear from you. But it's okay, we love you. We love you anyhow, okay? How many times have you heard that? Or, or your friends? You know, you think this is kind of aspirational, don't you think? Nobody from our town has ever done anything like this. I mean, who do you think you are to do that, actually? You know, everybody runs for the exit, you know, and they get the pack mentality, and all of a sudden, you're the boogeyman. You know, you're the, you're the next punching bag, you know, for the crowd that doesn't have the guts to show up, and give it a go. And there's also some guilt, too, by other people, media. Hey, you don't deserve that, you know? You got that because of privilege. And so then you start to shy away from that. What are you talking about? You're the one that turns the wheels of the bicycle. I mean, let's get real about this. So we got to know what's true to not spend our time on, on false guilt. Everyone in this room has some level of guilt about it at some point, for sure. And let me say something here about this, is that you're here on this planet the definition of a champion is a manifestor of their gifts. That's what a champion does. It's not about a gold medal. It's not about measuring yourself against other people. It's about are you manifesting your gifts as you know them to be true? Because there's only one of you in all of creation. There's never going to be another one of you. That's pretty cool when you think about it. Seven billion people on this planet right now, there's only one you. And there's only been 350 billion people on this planet since the first foot got put on this planet. And there's only one of you, and there's only going to be one of you. That's why we're here. It takes time and effort. You don't get a free pass. Nobody gets a free pass from that. But if you want to live a life of tranquility of being and feel like you deserve to go to sleep at night and have a good meal at night, then those are the things that we work for. Because every, if you want to influence a billion people, just show up and develop your gifts and come from your gifts. Because the degrees of separation are huge. But yet we all compare our gifts against the standard of how many people are going to influence. You don't know how many people are going to influence. You don't know that. Like when I was nine years old working at a bike shop, a guy came in wearing a t-shirt that said USA Olympic team on it. I wanted the t-shirt. He doesn't even remember wearing the t-shirt. And at that time, there was no internet. You know, you had to learn it the old fashioned way. You had to become an Olympian. So I went home and I drew a picture on a piece of cardboard, the t-shirt he was wearing. That was my logo that I was going to pursue for the next 10 years. And my plan was, be brave, work hard, no excuses. That was my plan when I was 11. So let's get real clear on some stuff here. If the, jo if the, uh, uh, if the idea is to tip the teeter-totter, you bring the board and I bring the grain of sand that tips it over, who brings the most important part? Well, we both do. You can't say that the grain of sand is less significant than the totter. You can't say that. So let's not put a judgment against what our gifts are and when we're going to try and when we're not going to try. Because you don't know. That's something in you telling you a lie is what that is. That's why it's really important to learn how to do that guilt-free. Because if it's the way everybody else does it, which is complete mythology at the very best, you know, all these freaking experts out there telling you all this crap that doesn't work, there's no historical basis. But somehow it seems believable because the expert must know, right? So we're going to challenge that, not to be an adversarial today, but to give you a chance at your best. Because I don't want to leave here uh, whenever I leave thinking that I didn't show up on your behalf, and that's the reason why I'm here today. I'm here to give you what's taken me 60 years. I'm 70 now. 60 years, I started my career in my pursuit of becoming an Olympian. I actually wanted to do it at seven. You know, I was a kid, I got up when I was five, and I went outside when everybody else was sleeping in the morning. This is for real. I had a little black baseball bat. I'd throw it up, and I hit it up and down the street by myself while everybody else was sleeping. I didn't need to be motivated. 
I didn't even know where I was going. But I showed up, and that's the first thing that champions do. So as I told this Google executive, we have to learn this guilt-free because guilt takes a lot of energy. And we've got to be clear about what the reality is. And the reality may not be the mythology that most people live their life by. We'll leave that up to them. Okay? So what I also said to the Google executive is that you can't waste time and energy. Time and energy wasted shortens your capacity to step up and deliver. You can't waste time and energy. But you've got to know how to do that because if you start to save time and energy, what do you do with it? You fill the vacuum with a bunch of other junk that you don't need, right? So all it does is spin your brain out and exhaust your body quicker because we think that's the path to the top is to do more per unit of time. It's not. It's about are we doing the right thing at the right time? So it's actually kind of pruning back all the stuff to the essential elements. So the essential elements that are there that can work in harmony make exponential possible. It's not about more. And then it's like, what sequence do you put stuff in? You know, most people walk around, they have this gunny sack, this bag. I had this vision in my head. They're, they're dragging this bag behind them of hacks, just this huge bag of hacks. All these independent things that if we do them all, we have a better chance of succeeding. No, you don't. And if you do, you don't know which ones are creating the change anyhow. Maybe 50 of the things that you're doing, 49 of them don't matter. But you don't know that. So we got to have some clarity here so we throw the ballast overboard. So we're a lean, mean, cruise machine to the winner's circle. We don't waste time and energy. And the final thing that I told him, I said, you can't blow yourself up. Because if you blow yourself up, then nothing matters. And I could tell you the time bomb is ticking in every one of us. And I think a lot of people instinctively know that. And it's like, how long can I keep this up before I blow myself up? And how bad is it going to be? You know, what's the detonation going to be like? And so if we blow ourselves up just when we start to figure it out, well, then it's a net loss of however many people are counting on you. You didn't do your job. You didn't finish the job. You're going to be the example that nobody should follow. That's the reality of it. Like my dad, genius. Uh, literally a genius, died homeless on the streets of New York City. So he's like, don't do what he did. That's like his uh, epitaph, right? So you can't blow yourself up. So then the question becomes, how fast is fast? So I could keep moving and get to the finish line, but if I blow myself up, you know, you find yourself in the zone of doom, then, then nothing, nothing matters. This is what I told him. And he's 42 is how old he is. He's in the zone of doom for sure. And so I said to him, well, would you kind of like to know the champion's sh shortcut? How many people here in this room would like a shortcut? Yeah, for those of you that didn't have, raise your hand, I, I, I'm not sure I believe you because, <laughs> you know, quite honestly, because here's the deal, is that everybody would pay tens of thousands of dollars for the shortcut. They would. Tens of thousands of dollars. Just give me the shortcut. All I care about is getting to the winner's circle. Just give me the shortcut. Well, the reality of this is, is that the faster you go, without knowing the variables that need to be controlled, the greater the risk you put yourself at. That is exactly the deal. And so we end up stalling at points in time that are completely predictable because we could not run our blind spots. So now what are we going to do? With, not possible. And so you can learn by your mistakes, it'll take you another couple of decades, if ever, to get to the finish line. So let's talk a little bit about the champion's shortcut. You ready? OK, number one, champion's shortcut. You've got to have a champion's mind. Champions make really good decisions. They may not be popular decisions, but generally speaking, you know, if you follow the herd, they're going to take you off the cliff. That's like predictable, that's standard. That's why everyone in this room is a myth, misfit. And that's how I knew that I was in the right audience. Because when I first met Nick, Nick asked me, well, you know, after we got a chance to know each other, which took about two seconds, um, you know, he kind of said, well, could you kind of describe me? I said, yeah, you got a bent frame. Nick has got a bent frame, meaning that he doesn't look at life the same way. Thank goodness he doesn't. 
because same equals subpar by definition. You have to have a champion's mind. <clears throat> now, what did you notice about the word I said there, mind? What do people generally say? Mind what? That's correct. Mindset, like it's set, it's rigid, it's fixed. So if I apply this formula, somehow it's going to get me to the winter circle. But that's garbage. No, it's not. That's something that you think about, and then you do your impulses anyhow, because it doesn't really have any influence. Or it's more about, I'm going to mow anything down in my way. Well, how does that work out for you? When you leave a trail of destruction 10 miles long behind you. Yeah, but I got to the victory circle. Oh, really? Well, how do you feel about that? How do other people feel about that? So I'm not so sure about that. So when we talk about a mind, we're talking about a flexible, pliable organism that's really reading circumstances in real time and making good. It's able to see, observe, store, collate, edit, and transmit editable information. It's a living, breathing organism is what that is. It's not what people think it is. That's the first thing. The second thing in the shortcut is, number one, you have to control your day. The day is the fundamental unit of life. And if you cannot control your day, you cannot control your life. And if you cannot control your life, then you're not believable as a leader. Because people smell what you can't do that makes them cautious. So therefore, your ability to enlist people and get their allegiance, like I will follow you to the ends of the earth because I trust you to take me to where I want to get to, where I can't take myself. Therefore, I will give you everything that I've got to ensure that you win, because if you win, I win. You've got to control your day. And you have to demonstrate that to make people feel confident. And you need to be confident in yourself. You can't lead if you don't believe that you can control a day, because you're going to put people at risk, and you know it. And there's something within us that doesn't want to take people off the cliff. And they smell our uncertainty. So you have to be able to control your day. Number three is that, and I was telling this guy that, I said, you have to know how to win. So what do you mean by that? You know, Google executive, what do you, what do you mean by I have to know how to win? I said, well, you know, winning's not an accident. It's like a learned skill. Wait a minute, I, I just thought you just try harder and you commit to doing more than anybody else and then you deserve to win. Doesn't that sound right to our human nature? Doesn't that sound right? And if I want it bad enough, it's going to happen, because I'm told that whatever I can conceive of, I will achieve. Really? Well, that's not what history tells us. It's like you're limited by your skills, your ability to read terrain, make good decisions in a timely manner, and being able to uh, be a credible source that people want to follow, because none of us can do everything. You know, one of the tenets of the champion space is, is that no one wins alone. It's not possible. So again, I, I appreciate the idea, and everybody you know, pats each other on the back and tells each other how great they are. But the fact is, is that, that there's a methodology that shows you how to win that's been proven over and over and over again. I've codified that, by the way, but only to say that you know, knowing how to win is a learned skill. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, how many people in this room are really confident that they can put the football into the end zone every time they get their hands on it? I mean, really. Is it more like roulette and we're hoping? Or is it, do we have a structure that history informs us of? And if history shows it, then we're not guessing that allows us to do this. And as I told the executive, it's like, you're 42. If you hang in there for another let's say 18 to 36 months, for you it's game over. Then you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. But if you trip and fall over the next 18, 12, maybe even 12 to 36 months, as the window's open, and you're in a rush to get to the finish line, you trip before the finish line, if you don't finish, you don't win. So you've got to know how to win. And then I said the other part of this shortcut is, is that you have to be able to peek around the corner. Like, can you peek around the corner and see what's coming? Or are we so fixated in the moment 
with hyper focus because all the experts tell us you got to hyper focus, keep your eye on the ball, take your eye off the ball, somebody's going to get in front of you, cut in line, you're not going to get behind the velvet rope, it's not going to happen. So remain as vigilant as possible, don't spend any time outside of the focus. That's the fastest way to get to the finish line. So there has to be a clairvoyance where we look at the circumstances happening outside of ourselves. We know where we are and we know what choices to make to move forward. And the way we do that, it's a simple equation. The one or two things that really matter are the things that you always look at. It's not a list of things to do that you draw your line through. It's like, what is the preeminent action to be taken now that everything else is dependent upon that keeps us moving forward? And that's always reshuffling. You know, people think, well, the plan will get us there. Well, the plan is a proposed estimate of what we perceive to be true in the future, and we're not there yet. But once you get there, then you have reality that your plan now has to address. And it may require some adjusting here. So only to say that we need to have a clairvoyance in this. And it takes a while to develop that because as we're going through life, unfortunately, most people learn by experience, which means for us, oh, well, we got this opportunity, 12 to 36 months, but I'm not going to learn the lessons that I need for the next two decades because I'm going to learn by trial and error. And so uh, not a really good idea if we have this window that's open and you can feel it start to close, correct? You can feel it start to close. And then, you know, you start to, mind starts to rub itself up, we start to panic a little bit, then we rush, then we start making mistakes. So we don't want that. And then I said the final thing that we need to look at here is zone pacing. Meaning that if your pacing is too fast or too slow, you're screwed because they both carry the same risk. If you go slower because you think it's safer, then what happens, you start to daydream. And somehow you give and empower the safety factor what you should be doing for yourself. Nope, you kind of got to be on edge all the time and you got to know what that is and what that feels like. But pacing is everything. And so when we look at pacing too fast, it's easy to not hold the centrifugal force in a corner and off the cliff you go but you still incur the same risk as it relates to going too slow. There's a certain speed that you gotta go. So in summary here, if we look at the shortcut, it may appear like a long cut, but it's not. The long cut is making choices from the assumption of things to be true where there's no historical evidence. Does that make sense? And you and I are having a real conversation here about this. You know, and I'm telling you the way that it is, based on what it takes to get to the top and stay there. And so I get it. You know, we have uh, a limited time here together today. I'll be around, of course. But the place that I want to start with today, I, let me pause here for a second, is what I've said so far, giving you kind of an overarching view of what it really takes to get there in a way that you have a resonance with. Because this isn't a gizmo that I came up with. This is an observation over 60 years, you know, being buried in the deepest levels of the high performance world in every discipline. This is not about a business tactic or strategy. This is about how do we steer the bus so we keep it on track and we have the shortest distance and the shortest time between where we are and where we want to get to. How's everybody feeling about this so far, just out of curiosity? I just want to make sure that I'm not always clear that I'm saying it in a clear way, so I just kind of wanted to check in, not on you, but check in like on myself. So are we ready to kind of move on here? Great. What I'd like to do is that I want to talk about the champion's mind exactly like, I'm going to share with you exactly like what I did with the Google executive. Fair enough? All right, so this is what I said to him. I said, okay, great. Uh, so what we need to be doing here is I said to him, 
is that we need to start with the champion's mind. He said, what about mindset? I said, it's not about a mindset. You know, as a matter of fact, mindset may not be your friend, you know, because it's too rigid. So let's talk about the champion's mind here, and that's where I want to start. And this is what I told him. I said, I want you to listen to me very carefully. And this guy, you know, big exec, he was responsible for a lot of stuff, a lot of pressure, took a lot of time to get where he is. He's now got this opportunity in front of him. The window's open. He knows it's going to close. If he gets it done right over the next, you know, 12 to 36 months, it's game freaking game over. Game over at 45, you know, and maybe your game at 30 is going to be over at 32 or 33. I don't know. As long as you listen to these guys, you know, you have a really good chance of making that happen. And that's the only reason I'm here. If I didn't believe them and know what they were doing, I wouldn't be here because that puts me at risk. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to only associate with those people that I care about. You think that I would, look, you know, I'm 40 years older than Nick, 40, 4 and yet he and I are talking. Why? Because we have a valued conversation every week for several hours that we just start. We don't even plan it. But what we do know is relevancy is going to be birthed in the conversation. And then we're going to have a sensible conversation about whatever it is that light starts to surface here. So you want to hear the real deal about the champion's mind. You ready for this? All right. So this is what I told the exec. So here we go. I said to the exec, before you even get started here, you've got to understand something about your human nature. So what, what do you mean human nature? I just want to get ready to take advantage of this opportunity. I said, well, if you do that, you know, you're putting yourself at serious risk. He said, okay, 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 all right, I get it, I, I, I get it, I get it. So let's slow down here. I said, great. So here's what you need to know about human nature, <clears throat> is that human nature actually has two mentalities side by side that are hardwired into our biology. And I want to be very clear that those words are chosen very explicitly, hardwired, meaning that they're part of our biology, and if we're human, we all share the same biology, correct? We all got a nervous system, digestive tract, we've got a musculoskeletal system, we've got all this other stuff, right, in common. That's what makes us human. And I said, when it comes to these two, hum to the, the human nature side of this, mentality number one, it's your human mindset. Hmm, interesting choice of words, human, that's right, we all got it, the same. And it's a mindset. Set means rigid, meaning that it's not flexible, it's not pliable. There are certain things that just are, that are not modifiable. Is everybody clear on that? Rigid structure. Human nature loves rigidity. It wants an itinerary for life like moving forward so it feels secure. Can we all agree on that? How does that deliver? Well, not always so good, right? But the good news is, is that we have a second mentality here, which is our champion's mind. And as I said before, champion mind implies a, a living, breathing organism that can store, edit, interpret, filter, and transmit lucid information from one point to another. And I told him, the thing you need to be mindful of is that both of these mentalities are at war with each other 24 hours a day from the first moment of your life to the last moment. And they're at war for one thing. It's control over your decision making. It's for control over your decision making. And you have to understand that. You know that low-grade anxiety that we kind of all feel that's always there? Why is that? Why is there this thing always sort of low-grade? Yeah, we may have moments of tranquility of being, but we have this sort of low-grade, ah, God, I just feel sort of scratchy. You know, I just sort of feel like there's pending doom, but then there's a little optimism, too. It's like it seems to be outside of myself. Well, it's actually inside yourself. And so I said, that's the battle for control over your decision making. I said, wow. I said, yeah, wow. So listen up. We've got to talk about this. I said, here's what you need to know about your hardwired human mindset. Number one is that these are a set of default beliefs that we have that are innate to us as a human that we don't necessarily ask for. And that's a really important part, default beliefs, meaning that if we're left to our own human devices and how we're experiencing life, there will be some things that occur to us that feel correct. 
that's part of our biology. You've probably been, been around people that kind of share the same thought, but you've never talked about it. But no matter where you go in the world, different cultures, different languages, they think the same way. I just got back from the Amazon like two days ago, three days ago. And in the Amazon, the indigenous tribes, they're doing this and they have no contact with the outside world. So where'd they come from? You know, they, they didn't go to school to learn that, but yet there's some way of thinking here that's common to us that we often refer to, oh, well, that's just human nature. Okay, great. Well, so we do have a basis of evidence for that, right? And so here's what you need to know about that. Because it's common to all of us as a human, its objective is survival. It's all about survival. 100% survival. It could give a crap about my gold medal. It could give a crap about your early retirement. It could care less about that. Because it's not about that. It's about survival. It's about survival. And so when I was talking with the executive about that, he said, oh, OK, yeah, it sounds great. But can you give me an example? Like in the physical world, can you give me an example? I say, well, I'll give you a couple. You know, try it on for size. Have you ever slipped on ice and your hand knows exactly where to put it faster than you can think to break the fall? Neurology is too slow to do that. Everybody thinks, oh, neuroscience is everything. Well, it's something, but it's not everything. Because this is happening. Nerve impulses propagate at a speed too slow to account for that. Well, why does this happen with such predictability that we can actually kind of rely on it but yet it's certainly outside of ourselves. You couldn't orchestrate that fast enough to make that happen. So clearly something was listening that made that happen. Oh, okay, I sort of get it. Can you give me another example? You know, and I appreciate that. I said, well, you know, have you ever been going through an intersection and some guy ran a red light and somehow you, know how to, you knew how to turn the car away to avoid a fatal injury? He said, yeah. I said, well, did you think your way to do that deliberately? He said, no. I said, well, where did it come from then? So th there's, there's clearly something at work here that's outside of the classic description in terms of biology to explain that. And, there, and we do have the ability to discuss that, but we're not going to do it today because we don't have time to do that. You just have to kind of take this as a given. And so the guy says, oh, OK, OK, Kara. You know, you can see him kind of looking at me. You know, you know that fish I look, right? And he said, well, what about in the psychological, emotional world? Is there an example? of this uh, survival mindset, I said, well, uh, and I'll ask you the same thing. It's like, has anybody ever said anything to you or done something to you where you said something that came out of your mouth faster than you can think that sounded like it was a really good idea? And then when you said it, it said it, how'd it work out? Well, it may take a year or 10 years to repair the relationship if you can repair it at all. And then what do we usually say? Well, uh, where did that come from? Well, that's a good question. And well, that's not me. Well, it clearly came from you. How can you say it's not you? So where did it come from? It's usually a defensive response to a psychological threat that we respond to that's hardwired into us. What else could it be? I mean, seriously, what else could it be? So we kind of do have this empirical evidence that we have this human mindset that is operational in my language. Is my language OK? Am I talking too fast or too slow? Are we in the conversation right now? I just want to make sure here. Because I think, I think sort of your life and your future depends on this conversation. And so um, just subtle, you know, but I kind of really feel like that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm here for you guys. So what I said to him, I said, uh, so I've got a couple more things to say about this human mindset. I said the next thing I'd like to say is because survival is an imperative that's based on nanoseconds. It has to be faster than you can think, otherwise you're dead. For sure, you're dead. Like the car example, guy running the red light, you're dead, just the way it is. And so I said, because it's high speed survival, it gets first dibs at every moment of your life. Every moment of our life runs through this filter. Because the preeminent uh, objective of the mind and body is preservation. That's why the brain is stuck within the, uh, the cranium, the skull bones. It's like inside of a bowling ball, right? It has to protect the brain because you can't live without a brain. And then the spinal cord sits in the vertebral column to protect it because you can't live without a spinal cord. You can live without arms or legs. That's why they're exposed. But you can't live without those vital things that are all based on fundamental primal like survival. And so it does get first dibs because if you die, then nothing matters. So that's how nature has sort of orchestrated the human biology on the side of it. 
But it, I'll also say here is that, like, what's the predicted outcome of this for one's life, as I told him? I said, well, that's how you repeat history. You know, have you ever done things over and over and over again? You wonder why you do it? You know, and today I promise that today is going to be output of what I want it to be. I'm not going to make everybody else's emergency my problem. Today is the day it's going to happen. And then what happens at the end of the day? Boom. Well, I'll, I'll try it again tomorrow, right? And so with that, if we start to understand this, do you start to see how now, well, maybe there's something within us that's not really us that we didn't ask for that's there, that's on 24 hours a day, that maybe isn't our friend in terms of progress towards our early retirement or our gold medal. It's about survival, but do I really want to live life through a series of moment by moment survival responses that can only repeat history, can't make it. How's that sound to everybody? Is that a great aspirational what? I don't think so. You know, it's a great friend to have, but I, I think in terms of the aspirational side of being able to manifest our gifts, as we discussed in prior, it, it's, it, it can't get you to that place, and no amount of will coming from that place that's automatic within us can get us there. Not possible. And so the good news is, as I told him, God, you can see, the further we got into the conversation, you can see him slump down in his chair and then the head sort of go around like this, you know, because he was starting to identify with what this was. And yet these people that were under him thought he could do no wrong. I, I'm sure many of you uh, have friends and family that think, well, what could possibly be wrong with your life? I mean, look, you're doing what you want to do. You know, you're making tons of money at your age. You know, you're going to Dallas to see Nick and crew. What could be better than that? You know, Petey and Mario, and then this guy named Jeff, this old guy that comes in. And so, um, you know, I think we just, again, we have this sort of interesting thing that we sort of know, look, the higher you go on the food chain, the more complicated life gets. I mean, seriously, if, if you go up like 10 octaves above where you are, like right now, it's so unbelievably complicated. It, it doesn't free you up. It just becomes more problematic. But, but we don't see that. We just think, well, if I had a million dollars, I mean, how many people, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but you know, probably everybody in this room has got a million dollars. You, know, you could have maybe gotten that in a couple of weeks you know, if you work with the right people. And so, again, uh, most people can't believe that if I didn't have a million dollars, my problems would be solved. But, but they don't realize that until you get there that, well, yeah, it was a great idea, but it didn't really exactly deliver on its promise. So, again, we kind of just need to be mindful of how we're really looking at this. And so then the question would be for you, like who do you go to talk to that you can have a, a same conversation with that understands where you are without thinking, oh yeah, well if I was there, I wouldn't be like this. Well, with that's not the truth either. They just don't know that yet. So, you know, we're having a bit of a interesting conversation as relates to that. So I said to him, the good news is we have the champion's mind here. So let me share a few things about that. I said, the, the champion's mind is, is really about, excuse me for turning around too, because I don't have a monitor to look at, so I just want to make sure that things are clicking forward here. I said that your champion's mind is really about applied wisdom. So what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, there's a general historic body of evidence that informs this. If certain actions are done, it can take us to where we want to get to. That may not be what you think, but if you're thinking through the eyes of your default beliefs and your human mindset, then of course you wouldn't believe that. But we know where that leads, correct? It doesn't take you to where you want to get to. So the applied wisdom that has been proven may seem contrarian to the human mind. Well, who is, what are the populations of human mind? Well, maybe it's your friends. Or maybe even it's your family. Well, what do you want to do that for? You know, when are you going to get a real job? You know, RJ, real job. You know, the usual list, are you sure you want to risk that? You know, I suggest that you do this, you know, and then once you've got this down, then you can go for that. By that time, all the windows are closed, right? So just to sort of say here that when we're talking about this idea of applied wisdom, and, and the key word is applied, because when we're talking about an application, that's a doing of, correct? And here's what I know, is that, as I said earlier, the human mindset is whirling in the background. You can't shut this off. This is like having a computer where the program is open and you can't shut it off. Something has to step in front of it to be able to override it that will then control the conversation. It's the only way you can deal with it. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to creep back to that which you wanted to avoid 
but you're always going to creep back if you don't apply that which has to go right because all the good stuff in life that's not automatic has to be applied to be maintained. But the important part about that is that it doesn't take as much to keep it as it did to get it in the first place. And so that's sort of the saving side of this. Am I talking in enough detail or too much detail right now for you guys? I want to know. Hands up. Is it good? De too much detail? Just write detail. OK, great. Green, green card. Yeah, 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 please. It, like we uh, discussed earlier here, we've got green card. We've got red card here. So if I ask, green card means we're good. Red card means we're not. This means I'm confused. You know, please uh, <laughs> give it another try, OK? All right, so let's uh, proceed here with our conversation. So the applied wisdom is going to take us towards excellence. Everybody see that right up there? And that's kind of where we want to get to. The applied wisdom we look at, and we can see that if we do this, it takes us here. And the here is the outcome that we desire to have. And there's countless examples of that, but it's usually contrarian, and all the experts or the press tries to talk you out of it, you know, generally speaking, OK? And I'm not demeaning those things. I'm just looking at some sources that we can maybe say to be true in some way, shape, or form here. And so the thing that we need to be mindful of in this discussion is that because it's not survival, it's an active choice that we decide. It doesn't get first dibs because it's not a survival imperative. But what it does get, what does it get? Everybody say it. What does it get? It gets the final say. It always does. It always wins if it's applied. So that's the secret. It, whatever has to go right must be applied to be maintained. It doesn't take as much effort to get it in the first place. And the outcome of that is what? Everybody say it. One, two, three. That's right. So if you want to make your own personal history, it's the only way you can do it. Otherwise, you're in prison. You're in jail to that which you didn't ask for. Sorry. It's just the way it is. This is kind of the structure is I see it. And um, you, know, you learn something if you survive to my age. And I will stand behind this because of the body of evidence here. And so the executive said, well, can you give me some examples of this? I said, I, I would be absolutely would love to. So number one, I said to him, is that, whoops, uh, I wanted to point out another point here. It said, if you look in the right-hand column, what does that say there? Supernatural wisdom restraints. And so now I'm going to share with you what the difference is between, on the left side of the chart, our natural survival impulses versus our supernatural wisdom restraints. And the reason why I use restraint is because restraint is the most important word in your vocabulary. If you cannot restrain yourself, you're, you're toast. Or, or you can only go as far as your ability to demonstrate restraint, which means going against your human nature. Human nature remembers about survival. It doesn't care about your prosperity or the level of uh, personal value that you get in terms of living a life of value and contribution. It could give a crap about that. It, it, does, it does not care, because that's not why it's there. And so let's be really clear. So I said to him, OK, let's give some examples here. I said the first example is, given an opportunity, the human mindset's going to say, well, what do I stand to lose here? Yeah, what do you say we go out? Let's play really good defense with life. What do you say? Let's just back up, and let's just play really good defense. How does that sound? Does defense get you into the end zone? Yes or no? No, you, you can't get into the end zone by playing defense. And if you play defense, like, do you want to share? Do you want to hug? Is it cold? Is it warm? Is it expansive? No, it's exactly the opposite. It's constrictive. It wants to hoard, doesn't want to share, could care less about hugging. You know, it, that's not what it's designed for. It's the, designed for survival. I'm going to hoard for myself stuff, and I'm not going to tell you that I got it. Because if the game of musical chairs goes off, uh, you're going to be a person left standing, not me. You know? Doesn't that sound like just a great way to play? How would you like to have teammates like that? Wouldn't that be awesome? I don't think so. So champions aren't like that. You know, champions are, what do I stand to gain? They know that there's 
an infinite number of opportunities, and if there's only one of us in all the creation that has a unique gift, then we're not fighting for the same slice of pie. You know, there's a distinct uh, piece of pie for us. This is called the Nick effect. When Nick moves, people watch, which they should. I hang on those every word. <laughs> there you go, man. So uh, the point I want to be very clear on here is that performing based on what you stand to gain is an offensive play that supports all your teammates and everybody else. Because it recognizes we're not fighting for the same slice of the pie. It's unique to us. And everybody's got a seat at the table here. So it's expansive, it's big, it's aspirational, it wants to share. There's plenty of room for everybody. How many people that you know that, that play on that side of the aisle? OK, so he said, all right, I can buy that. So what's next here on the agenda? I said, well, let's say you're given an accountability. I said, well, the human mindset, well, I'm doing my best. And uh, I said, is that really the right wording here? Or are you deciding too early in the conversation that you're doing your best or you've already set your bar low to build in an excuse to why you can't go higher? And yeah, legitimately, there's a place where people can't do their best. But if it's a reflex answer too quick, it's generally sort of a built-in safety valve to make a lower level of aspiration that you could achieve possible. And we don't want to do that because that's not the way the champions play. And that's why we're having this conversation. We're not here to explain to other people. We're here to talk about you. And we're talking about the real game. If that's what we want to talk about, well, we're having a conversation about the real game. And so I said, you know, it's all about finding a way. So what do you, why would you say that? Well, I said, well, you're given creativity, and you're given curiosity, and you're also given a desire to inquire. Why do you think we have that? It's a way, it's, it's a mechanism by which we can find a way that other people have already decided is impossible. Like my daughter, Dad, we're going to lose tonight in soccer. Well, how do you know that? Well, I heard the team's bigger than us. So therefore, that means you're going to lose? Yeah, I just sort of feel it in my body. I said, well, can you put that aside? And can't we just sort of go out there and play the game? And let's sort of look at that after the game. Can you actually, can you do that, please? And those, she did that, and they went out, and then they won. I said, well, what did you learn from this? She said, well, I was prophesizing something that uh, wasn't real, but it sure felt real. I said, OK, well, you've learned a very valuable lesson, that that which seems natural to us isn't always your friend. It's a perfect demonstration, as she knows, of the human mindset versus the champion's mind. And so I went on to say, well, uh, you may say that it's in your genes. Oh, I see. So you're, you're, you're predetermining your outcome. You're just going along for the ride for 70, 80, 90 years, or in Dave Asprey's ca case, 180 years, to um, just uh, leave this all up to your genes. Well, we certainly know that that's not true, because we know genes express based upon the environment that they're placed in. So there's a lot more to the story that does involve a level of accountability. And so with that being said, it, it's really in your power. I mean, if you kind of think about that, it's like, why are you given a mind, a body? Uh, why are you given a soul and a spirit? Wh why do we have those things? Well, we have those things to be able to recognize that we do have a capacity to self-select and self-apply and self-acquire. That's why we have these assets as a human that puts us at choice. But we're in this continuous conflict. We're in this continuous conflict. As a matter of fact, a human mindset thing, the human mindset will make you think, well, you know, if you think like that, therefore uh, you uh, will manifest that what you think, which isn't necessarily true at all. So when we look at this conversation further, Gosh, I were, wish I was only like others. And so I, I told the executive, I said, OK, so I, I bet that you're feeling, gosh, if I were only like others, uh, I could fit in, and I wouldn't feel the pain and the turmoil and the turbulence that I feel right now. And I said, well, do you really want to be like every, every other drop of water in the sea of all alike? And you want to forfeit your uniqueness just to fit in with everybody else? Is that how you're going to honor this path through this life? 
said, man, I never thought of it like that. And I said, well, you better think about it because you're going to be responsible for that at some point. You know, at the end of the day, you're not going to take your junk with you. You know? So I said that, you know, in the champion space, they fight really hard in terms of standing behind their greatest asset, which is them. There's nobody like you in this creation. Does that give you a free pass to get to the finish line without having to do anything? No, because you have to prove your commitment to it to honor that possibility that only we can do through the actions. And this is not an easy thing to do if we really truly want to do that. You have to be cut from a little bit different type of cloth. And I went on to say here that it's more than just will and talent. There's plenty of will and talent out there that goes nowhere. So yeah, do you need will and talent? Sure you do. But it's not going to take you to where you want to get to that supersedes the other things that we're talking about here, like right now. But what it's really about, it's about discipline and readiness. Because if you don't have the discipline to show up, then it's not going to matter because your timing is going to be off. Champions know first thing you do is show up on time. Don't show up late. And then what is readiness? Readiness is a comprehensive state of being about your assets as you have them at any point in time to pursue every one of the goals that you have. And that's what we use to dictate what your path forward is going to look like. So a state of readiness is everything. And that's the first thing that we need to know when we're creating a plan for you to move forward from where you are to where you want to get to. We've got to know your state of readiness. Most people don't want that. I'll give you 50,000 bucks if you can get me to the finish line. I want the shortcut. I'll pay anything for it. Well, look, if you don't know the state of readiness, you don't know the variables you've got to control, the faster you go, the more you, sell, you put yourself at risk. That's the reality like behind this. And so when we were discussing this, um, uh, I said that the human mindset thinks that it's all about perfection. And what I told the executive, I said, this is your problem. Because you think you have to be perfect to take advantage of this opportunity. And so you and your team are obsessed with having a contingency for every detail, thinking that if you cover all the bases for every detail, you're going to be properly prepared to be able to take advantage of this lifetime opportunity to be able to perhaps retire in 12 to 36 months. And I said, that's a great idea, but here's the problem with perfection in your human mindset. Are you guys starting to get the idea here between human mindset, the being you know, captive and you know, chained to that because it's always there and you can't shut it off? I said, your human mind is going to make you think that you've got to be perfect. Therefore, you're going to continually look for all the details. And eventually, you're going to start looking for details that aren't there. And you're going to think, well, there's something that I'm missing here. And if I don't find it, you're going to invest all your confidence in that which you don't know. Because of course, I'm not smart enough to see everything. That's the human mindset telling us another lie. And then we kind of believe it because we know that we got a, a D in handwriting in third grade. And even though we're 42 now, we remember that. That was traumatic. Maybe everybody's right. You know, mom told us we couldn't do it. So, you know, all the fears start to pop up, totally predictable. And we start to then drink the Kool-Aid. Then things start to spiral down. Classic. And so I said, it's not really about being perfect. I said, it's about doing the one or two things that matter. Because when you do the one or two things that count consistently, then that's the fastest path forward that has the highest level of reality. And so all the plans that we make are always subject to modification as the plans meet reality, because the plan is a projection of what we believe to be true in the future, but we're not there yet. So how can you say that that's the case? You can't say that. You don't know. But yet your human mindset tells you opposite. You got to be super detailed. You're not ready to move yet. You need another six weeks to get ready. The opportunity is now, but I, I, I'm not ready. Not, well, maybe you are ready. You know, like okay, so the, the 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 technical stuff didn't work this morning. So what? We're having a great conversation right now, right? And so maybe that had to go right for us to have this level of conversation. So let's not decide on what it is. Let's leave that to the amateurs. Let's embrace like right now, right? And so I told him, as long as you pay attention to the one or two things that count, like I'll tell you, you just need to know what those are. Well, where do those come from? They come from the five areas. They come from the champion's mind. They come from being able to control the day. They come from, do you know how to win? They come from, can you peek around the corner? They come from, can you pace? The answers are always stuck within those five items, for sure. You just need to find them and apply them. 
And uh, here's the other trick is that your brain's going to make you think, well, you're always changing things, therefore you cannot uh, make a decision that you can stick with over time. Yeah, you're right, I can't. Something's wrong with me. No, something's very right with you. See how it tells us this, these fabrications that seem so real to us. Don't they seem really real? But if you look at them, it's all garbage because it can't possibly take us to where we want to get to. So I said to him, you know, I know you're afraid and you kind of don't want to try because you feel that if you try and you fail, you're accountable for that. And what are people are going to say about it? That's what, you, that's what you think. And I said, here's what you need to know about fear is that the symptoms of fear are a state of biological readiness that inform you that you're ready to um, engage something that's outside your reach. It's your friend. It's telling you that you're now ready if you've vetted your preparation. And I said that people that feel in state that they lead a fear-free life are generally reckless if they do that. They're not responsible. <clears throat> or they have low-grade anxiety that sits kind of right back here. And that low-grade anxiety is because they don't know the edges of their box because they're not testing themselves against their edges. And if you don't test yourself against the edges, you don't even know who you are. So I said that we got all this backwards. So again, you do what the champions do. You trust your preparation if it's valid. And we have information that confirms that. And then you take action on what you know to be true through how you've prepared. Because at a certain point in everything, there's nothing left to do other than to push the go button. And you eventually get to that place. And so I said to him, look, I kind of got the report here that people are sick and tired of your whining. So why don't you just, I was going to say something other that I won't say, but why don't you just not do that? Can you just sort of know that every time you whine, you distrust yourself a little bit more. You don't believe in yourself. Every time you whine, you're discrediting yourself, and you know that. You feel less capable of. You walk away feeling just a little bit less confident in yourself. Well, it's not only you. It's everybody around you. They're sick of it. Every time you make an excuse or a fabrication or some declaration that's not true, try to create a cheerleading session that's not real, your credibility diminishes. You know, and you're starting to exhaust your shelf life, quite honestly. So I said to him, you get back to what got you here. You have to come at this from a perspective of winning, because that's what the champions do. And so the final thing I said here to him is, is that you got a choice that you got to make like right now, because you can't go home and think about this stuff. I said, you have to decide whether you're going to come from human mindset or the champion's mind, you've got to decide that. So let me give you a preview. I said to him, and I want you to hear what I had to say to him. He said, at the very best, you're going to be a one-act wonder. If you fumble this, you're going to be a one-act wonder. You're going to be the guy that had the opportunity. The door was wide open. You had all the gifts. You were poised to step on the top rung of the podium, but you tripped before you got there, and unfortunately, you're the guy that could have but didn't. And you're going to have to get up to that every moment of your life, every day of your life for the rest of your life. Is, is that what you want to get up to? Man, you should have seen him. Like, the face went straight down. You know? Because I'll also tell you this. The people that I work with, you know, they, some of them play a really big game, like really big. And I always ask them what their greatest fear is. What they say to me is letting people down. That's what they say the biggest fear is. I, I, the fear of letting people down is, is crushing to me. So the idea of being a one-act wonder, if that's every one of us is going to have a glimpse of what we're capable of. But the question is, can you repeat it and can you build upon it? And if you don't have the structure, like we've been discussing here, it's, it's a guessing game. It's not about trying harder, having a more detailed uh, plan. It's about the nuances that, that hold this together. So what I said, if you come from the human mindset, you're going to be impulsive because you're going to want to try to cover all the bases, doing everything to uh, kind of split the average of everything as an insurance policy against uh, the worst possible scenario. But because you're impulsive and you're trying to do everything, the challenge with that is, is that you're going to be terminally frustrated because it can't deliver. 
and as a result of that, your life is going to be mediocre, mediocre, just the way it is. I've never seen an example that has been able to find its way onto the top rung of the box coming from that. And so I said that if you choose to come from the champion's mind, like what history tells us, is that you will become a repeat winner because it's a flexible process by which there's nothing that you can't engage, starting with having the right goal. Lots of smart goals. There are lots of big, audacious goals, but the goals that every one of us needs to have are the right goals. You got to have the right goal. And so the repeat winner is courageous. Now, why are they courageous? Because they're doing the opposite of what everybody else is telling them. Well, wait a minute. You're showing restraint here. If you really cared, you'd be pushing harder. How do you expect to get moving in, into the winner circle if you show restraint and you take a little bit of time off? I mean, doesn't that sound right? Isn't that just a typical human mindset thing that we would expect our fear-based survival impulses to tell us? You're wasting time because you're doing something outside of and it's taking you away from doing an action that could propel us forward. Total lie. Total human mindset lie. Never proven to be the case. The likelihood of stumbling over yourself due to battle fatigue is much greater. You've got to be courageous because not everybody's going to like this because it's oppositional to the way that the herd generally thinks. So you just have to prepare yourself. Higher you go, bigger the target. Just the way it is. But also, there's the composure side of it. Because you have a body of evidence that you can refer to that informs you about what's predicted over through all of humanity, you're composed because you're looking at the one or two things that have to go right. You don't need to know everything. You're not trying to be perfect. You're making good choices. You're agile. And you're prepared. I mean, what more do you need? And so I said, as a result of that, you can lead an exceptional life. And so what he did, he went on to capitalize on the opportunity. He has gained more progress in the last six months that would pay, take people maybe 10 years to get to because of the simplification of using restraint and doing the one or two things that count based upon the evidence of what the context tells us. And that's how he did it. I have more to say about this. I have some more things to say here. But I want to check in with you first to see if there's anything that I should be saying to clarify anything that I said there at this time. And I want to also check in with the hosts here because we did have a kind of a delay here today. One question. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, of course. Plus, I did it in gold as well. <laughs> the other one was blue, but I sort of like the gold, you know? So you guys are the first to see it in the gold version here. Absolutely. Um, I just have to ask the hosts here, do we have some more time to go through this, or where are we in the program? Just, I want to respect. You're good. Oh. You have two days. OK. <laughs> Can I have a drink of water? <laughs> okay, all right, all right, so, all right, so, so what I'd like to do uh, here, I want everybody to stand up, if you would, please. And uh, let's make a 90 degree turn towards the window. And I want you to put your hands on the shoulders in front of the person, on the shoulders of the person in front of you. Okay, let's move up. There you go, there you go, okay? All right, th you guys can, st yeah, everybody, everybody, gets, everybody gets the love in this direction. Okay, and let's just give a gentle massage to your teammates here, just a nice little gentle massage there. <laughs> uh. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we're going to do this for 20 minutes in this direction. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's great. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, now let's all turn around and get your revenge. Okay, turn around and get your revenge. <laughs> I, I think he's getting robbed here. He needs yeah. some love, man. That's that's not right. Hey, never whatever that says there. I mean, I just. Oh, he needs some love there. I mean, I mean, I, I feel that's not right. Come on, man. Put it in reverse. Back up, man. All right, there we go. All right, so let's all take our seats here. Okay, let's take our seats. All right, let's take our seats, everybody. Let's take our seats here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have a question to ask of the audience here, please. Is that um, I have kind of three other parts to this. I'd love to get through with the permission of the hosts, and we can stop any time. I'll leave that up to them. Um, I would like to get through one other section, then maybe we could take a short break and then come back. Would that be acceptable, Nick? Yes. Yeah, OK, all right. So let's uh, shift gears here just a little bit. So this is sort of our overview here of the um, human dilemma that we all share. And if we don't understand this, I could, I could just honestly say you're freaking screwed. Because if you identify with the human mindset as you, you're toast, you're done. So let's take another look at this. And we're going to do this through the eyes of the biology. So let's talk about the biology of the human um, mentalities, of which we have two that we've talked about here. So. When we go back to our chart here, we're just going to blow through this. So we're going to say that uh, these elements are exactly the same. These never change. But now we're going to compare the biology between the two. Fair enough? OK, you ready? And I'll make all this available to you guys. OK? So number one, in the human mindset, uh, this is all about tension. Because it's, it's fear-based. It's fear-based because it's about survival. If you're on survival, you're always wondering where the next uh, punching bag is going to come from. And so naturally, we'll be in a constant state of tension, which steals a lot of energy. It also clouds our mind. It sets off a, uh, a stress cascade of hormones that uh, are very destructive to the body. And so when we do the champion's mind, this is a state of relaxation. It's a different part of the nervous system. Our confidence is there. Um, we make much better decisions, like when we're relaxed. Next, if we go back to the human mindset, it's pro-aging. Because uh, when our stress hormones are up and moving, it's catabolic. It breaks the body down. It uh, prevents sound recovery sleep. It uh, increases inflammation. Everything that accelerates uh, that premature demise, which we need to avoid at all costs. When we look at the uh, human mindset, the biology. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me, it's anti-aging, the champion's mind. Of course it is, because it falls into the relaxation categories. The digestive tract is calm. You're breaking food down. It's getting into circulation. It's going into the cells for body growth, body repair, and also for energy production. If we go back to continue our conversation here about the biology, the human mindset is all about depletion. <clears throat> Because all of the sleep hours that we're not getting, and because the digestive tract shuts off because of the stress, the nutrient pool, neurotransmitters, hormones, nutrients to build, repair, recover, those are compromised. We eventually find ourselves in a state of depletion. And you've got about 20 or 30 years of reserves on board. <clears throat> and if you start your career early, then at the end of the 20th year, let's say you started at 18, 18, 28, at 38, you're empty. And that's where you begin the zone of doom, the kill zone, actually, because people are dying from heart attacks and strokes in their late 30s and their late 40s. And uh, if you don't know where your tank is, then you run a risk of a serious either uh, physical meltdown, deterioration, detonation, or a severe relationship failure that can cost you 20 or 30 years of time and effort can be wiped off the face of the earth in a split second. So we need to kind of keep our 
eyes on track of what our gas gauge is and not kind of fool ourselves by saying it hasn't hurt me so far because there's a hidden world that is there that we need to be mindful of. Because it doesn't care about what we think. You can think whatever you want, but if it's not in line with biology, then the consequences still remain. So when we talk about the depletions, uh, when we're talking about the champion's mindset, it's all about restoration. Because you're sleeping well, there's always time to eat correctly and exercise and doing all of the things that are required at a minimum to pay back the daily debt that we incur from the push that we do. And there's, of course, lots of details in this that we don't have time for, but I want to make sure you get the bigger picture. Because you, what's at stake here? It's your future is at stake with every one of these things that we're talking about. And, and I want you to be and have full disclosure about what we need to be mindful of about how we're engaging life moment by moment. When we go back to the human mindset again, energy drain for sure, because <clears throat> Fear is on 24 hours a day, and also fear is about self-interest. It only cares about me, but from a perspective of loss. And if you're only making decisions about what you fear you're going to lose, it takes a lot of energy because you're in a constant state of worry. And because of that, you got your foot stomped on the accelerator that's pro-aging. You're digging what could be an irreversible whole for yourself where the champions know that it's actually an energy gain and I can tell you this is that you, you, you're always going to have enough energy to do whatever is necessary if what you're doing uh, is uh, in service to you honoring your talents and your gifts taking care of yourself and your family and humanity simultaneously uh, and that's uh, something that's certainly achievable. None of us are meant to be human sacrifices for others. You know, there's got to be a payback for us, but as part of that payback and part of how we get there is of service that we can be to other people in the process. Where the, where the uh, energy side of it gets complicated is when it's all about me and it's not about others. And we know that anything that smells like that is human mindset for sure. So if we talk about racing mind, racing mind uh, for sure is human mindset. And um, this is a really good metric to, to be looking at. And if you find yourself getting up at 1 AM, walking around, you know, wondering what you're going to do next, you can't shut your brain off, uh, your day is probably not organized correctly enough to be able to hold space for uh, a full and complete recovery over time like that. And there is a point of diminishing return if the mind races too long, too fast. And there's some physical implications of that as well. So let's be mindful of that, where composure is the name of the game in the champion space. <clears throat> and if I can ask you a, a question here, what's the most important word in the champion's vocabulary? Restraint. Restraint, 100%. Isn't that just kind of exactly opposite of what your human mindset wants to tell you? Restraint means you're going to get left behind. You know, restraint to the creative, that's like red kryptonite. You know, that's the one thing that they don't want to hear. And I say that affectionately. Is this in enough detail just to sort of get the idea? Because I don't want to get into all the, the nuances of it, but just enough to say that you can't outrun this. And how you feel can't, doesn't tell you the truth about this, you know, either. I just want you to have a general awareness of this because everybody's got a time bomb potentially ticking and you don't want it to detonate because if it detonates, it takes 10 times as much time and effort to get back what you're going to lose. Adrenal fatigue, you figure nine months to a year to get over it. Just be ready for it if that happens. And no amount of will can transcend it. And so keeping tabs on this as you go is a really important uh, feature of this. Uh, when we talk about human mindset, it's hyperfocus. Yeah, I get that. Hyperfocus is important, but the, the challenge with hyperfocus is that um, it puts a lot of tension into the body. Tension equals poor sleep, poor recovery. Hyperfocus, yes, at appropriate time, but it needs to be modulated with um, the idea of peripheral gaze and being able to contemplate big and where you are, et cetera. 
And this is covered in another uh, process and project that Nick and I are working on called the Champion's Perfect Day. You know, Champion's Perfect Day, uh, when it's done correctly and specific to our personalized needs, it's our insurance policy that we'll never find ourselves stuck in the hole that most people will find themselves in. Uh, Hyperfocus, full awareness um, is the key here. And when we talk about full awareness, that means I can get stuff done because I'm hyperfocusing, but I also have an awareness of the periphery. And why this is important is that in the periphery, two things that are our friends will be there. But if we're hyper-focused, you can't see it. In the periphery, you're going to see better options. Because better options always show up, but they don't scream and yell. But they show up in our consciousness because what we think the best is is a projection of what we can conceive of at a moment in time that may be severely limiting, but we don't know that. And so when better options show up, it may be a change in course direction that's better because the course that we're on may be becoming irrelevant. It may have no shelf life like left. So the idea of having this peripheral awareness, well, I know I'm supposed to hyperfocus. If I think about this, I'm not hyperfocusing. How can I move forward if I'm not hyperfocusing? And I spend time here. Well, that, it, you would only hear that from an amateur or, you know, or some expert that's promising a shortcut that sounds good to our human nature, that's our first dibs, correct? See how that works? So we gotta kinda be on guard because it's like really tricky. You know, there's a jungle out there that we need to sort of interpret as we're going through it. So this idea of full awareness, the other thing that's in our peripheral view is also gonna be a blind side. Have you ever had anything happen and you realize, you know what, I got warning of that. I, 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 I saw it for a second, I knew it was there. But it was so small I didn't pay attention to it. You know, that's how this works. It's kind of like, well, you know, you're really listening. Well, I guess I'll just have to teach you the hard way. You know, you're just going to lose a year, two years of progress. But, you know, if you're not going to listen to me, I guess that's how you're going to learn your lesson. So that's why this idea of uh, full spectrum is important. Enough detail to be relevant, but not too much that we're slowing down. Okay, great. So let's move on here. Let's talk about distance. If we're in the human mindset, we're thinking just about us. But it's mostly from fear, is what it is. So therefore, we're not available to people. You know, even though the carcass is there, there's no electromagnetic signature that can be uh, perceived by those in proximity. So we show up as a, an empty shell, unavailable. And that over time is obviously very destructive to relationships that can maybe not be repaired. And over time, people are gonna to get to the end point where you've been telling me for the last 10 years, once we arrive, it's gonna be different. That's what I've been hearing. Well, where's the promise, pal? You know, this isn't working out so well now. Or this could be 20 years. I, I promise I'll get back to my health practices once I arrive, it's right around the corner. Well, you said that 10 years ago. You know, we're still not there yet. Time's up, sorry. I know a guy, uh, one of my clients who owns a financial firm, someone in his organization, his wife left him and moved to Las Vegas, just packed up and left. Be this is like a month ago because the guy, time is up. Sorry, man. I've heard this too many times. I'm gone. See ya. Bye. So. Distance, whereas in the champion space here, intimacy is always possible because you, you, you recognize that, you know, the real payoff of tranquility of being in value is the person that we should emulate to be worthy of consideration by others to look at as a case study to follow, not as a statistic that we should avoid at all costs, especially in today's world that is begging for beacons of hope, sanity, and courage in a world that's, I'm gonna say, much worse than lost its way, you know, kind of seems to be upside down in certain instances. And so we need bodies of evidence. And the fact that you could come from this place, I think it could be enough because you're showing other people that change in the human dimension is possible. Reading it in a book is one thing, but to experience in 3D makes it believable and possible. 
and people need one of my most important favorite four letter words, hope, like H-O-P-E. And when we talk about the human mindset, it's a teardown. You know, every extra push is catabolic. It breaks your tissues down. It breaks your immunity down. It increases our window of vulnerability silently behind the scenes as we continue to push harder and harder. And the fuse on the bomb that's going to detonate gets shorter and shorter. It's only a matter of how bad it's going to be and when it's going to blow. And it's different depending upon genetics and other stuff. But we just need to be mindful of that you know, the hormones that are put into circulation, because of this, uh, you cannot outrun those. You cannot mind over matter that which is not there, that needs to be there in matter, not possible. And so therefore, uh, we need to live a, an anabolic lifestyle where there's a building up of uh, mind, body, and soul, and spirit, to be an example of, wow, you know, I'd like to be like you. Why, why are you like this? Well, generally, it's because we have adopted methods that have proven themselves to be true. We're not guessing at it. And you know, we have the courage to implement those things consistently. And we live a life of restraint. And we live a life of composure. And therefore, we can live through this lens of a high degree of productivity, creating a great memorable legacy. Because you have to remember something here is that your legacy sort of begins once you got it figured out. It may take a decade or two to, to get there, where the real significant number of changes start to happen once you got the game figured out. But if we don't make it to that point, then we don't get there. You know, it's like a, a skeleton of what it could be. And so therefore, when we talk about this idea of the human mindset, if this is the way we do it biologically, just figure, just plan on getting left behind. Because you, you're not going to have the physical capacity to do it. It's not going to happen. Eventually, either that or it will be a relationship stall that will prevent you from moving forward. You're going to get left behind. You're going to be the, the kid that I described that's you know, watching the school bus proceeding ahead into the dis distance where everybody else has got the nose pressed against the glass. They're waving and laughing their heads off at you because you missed the bus. We don't want to do that, but that, that's where this is headed. If we choose to go through the champion's mindset side of this, uh, for sure, again, it all kind of leads back to repeat winner because that's what this is calibrated towards, and it gives us the biology to do this. And therefore, being courageous to apply these things. Oh, you a health nut? Oh, you're going to sleep early? Well, just think uh, about the other people that aren't going to sleep. They got the competitive advantage. Because while you're sleeping, they're working. Therefore, you're behind. Does that sound like human mindset? Give me a red or a green card on what I just said there. You're sleeping while other people are getting the advantage. Is that a red or is that a green card? Absolutely red card. Red, ca red card out, tap out. That's exactly what that is. And so we're composed and we can live an exceptional life. So that's the biology of that. Was that important? Was that a value? Great. I want to go back to the host. Host, can we take like a five minute break and come back and resume? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, so five minutes is five minutes, five minutes is not 10 minutes. You got five minutes, ready, go. 4.59, 4.58. I have, anybody wants to ask a question, I'll be up here at the front. We'll see everybody in five minutes.